Hi there, and good evening, and welcome to the Jimbo Hannon Show from Westwood One Radio. We're at one 560 jimbo one 505 Online, find us at jimbohannonshow.com. You can follow us on Twitter, at Jimbo Talks, and thanks for being part of the program tonight. We're joined by Brandon Daniels. He is the president of Global Markets at Exeger, a, a company online at its name, E-X-I-G-E-R, Exeger.com. Uh, good evening, Mr. Daniels. What uh, does Exeger do? Good evening, Jim. Um, well, we're, we're really three things. Uh, we are a compliance management and systems provider. Uh, we're a crisis management uh, uh, company. So when you have those critical situations, whether you're a major pharmaceutical company or you're the U.S. federal government during the COVID-19 response, you come to Exeter to help to manage uh, crisis situations. And then lastly, um, we are a monitorship and investigations company uh, that has been involved in the largest and most comprehensive corporate monitorships in U.S. history. Um, and so we, we manage everything, governance, risk, and compliance across the federal government, financial services, and the corporate market. Oh, very good. Well, that's uh, what we call an all-encompassing mandate right there. Now then, a key question to talk about tonight. Uh, we're going to get a vaccine apparently uh, fairly soon. We'll talk more about that uh, when part here in a second. But we're going to get right to the nub of the issue. Okay, we get a vaccine, and who gets it first? That's a very interesting question. Uh, who uh, would get it first now? Are there existing guidelines in that regard? So the guidelines of vaccine delivery are going to be driven by the vaccine platform and vaccine availability. There are certain platforms, and they happen to be ones that are in later stage trials, that do allow for rapid production. And those platforms that allow for rapid production uh, could allow for a larger swath of the population to get it faster. Now, that doesn't mean there won't be a prioritization, Jim. Uh, what it does mean is that when the FDA goes through its approval process and we have an approved vaccine, that millions of people, so high-risk populations, uh, those that are in uh, target demographics like immunosuppressed folks, uh, folks in older age brackets, um, will inherently uh, have to be prioritized, um, as well as frontline workers, you know, healthcare workers will have to be prioritized in the delivery of vaccines. But w we should see that gap get covered quickly because of some of the um, things that industry is doing to partner up and to create what we call hot production lines. So fill to finish production lines for vaccine delivery systems, um, as well as the things that the federal government is doing to pre-buy and almost like you've seen in war times, create demand in advance of the actual supply. All right, let's say somebody says the following, very quietly, of course, and under the table, hey, I got $3.7 billion, and I gave a bunch of it to your last campaign. Now it's payback time. You owe me. Put me at the head of the line. Um, I think the uh, criteria for who gets the vaccine will allow for those at-risk populations, uh, frontline healthcare workers, and those in need to get the vaccine as soon as is possible. And then there's always the opportunity for economic demand, right? So um, does that mean there's always the opportunity for bribery? I mean, <laughs> There isn't, there isn't always the opportunity for bribery. And, and you've got to remember that 
the, the people selling these uh, products are going to be private industry, right? Yeah. Um, there's always the opportunity for um, people uh, to be considered as a part of the at risk or critical population yeah. because of the office they hold or yeah. because of the you know the economic activity right. but let create. me let me change my little bribery pitch there hey i got 3.7 yeah. billion bucks and i also happen to own 15 percent of this company i mean we'll, we'll change it from political to corporate uh in other words uh, i suppose what you're saying essentially uh, brandon is that uh, uh, uh human frailties can figure into to any circumstance but there is at least a structure uh, in which there is supposed to be a rational and non preferential basis for handing out a vaccine. And I gathered that uh, you you spoke principally of first responders, the people who keep the rest of us safe and who therefore mm -hmm. expose themselves, and also high-risk groups, which I assume to include uh, the elderly and people with pre-existing conditions. Is that a good overall list of what uh, ideally would uh, be at the top of the priority? I think it's undoubtedly what would be at the top of the priority, yes. Yeah. And like you said, Humans are humans, right? Money yeah. is money. And so there's there's always going to be cracks and crevices. But that, I don't think, is going to be at such a high volume to put the rest of the population in some sort of jeopardy. All right. There, in that case, I will uh, withdraw my 3.7 fictitious billion dollars. <laughs> <laughs> it felt pretty good there for a second. Wow. Hey, yeah. I, am, I am hot stuff. That's, that's a good amount of money. Uh, it is. I just picked that at random. Uh, but uh, still, yeah. still working on my first billion with a long way to go. Uh, <laughs> I'm told that uh, now the one new study that I found out that uh, Pfizer's coronavirus vaccine could be distributed to Americans before the end of the year. Uh, that, uh, in fact, they should have key data from their late stage trials for the Food and Drug Administration by the end of next month. Uh, that, uh, I suppose, roughly parallels some of the, the teases that uh, President Trump has uh, has given us. So uh, uh, does that uh, uh, mirror what you've heard, that uh, the end of the year, uh, that is to say m almost certainly after the election, but say around the end of the year, uh, that some of us should start getting vaccinations? Uh, that is what physicians uh, that are in uh, the actual vaccine trial process or are a part of securing those downstream supply chains from the research de and development process into delivery are telling me. They're telling me that it is um, very likely that we will see a vaccine by the end of the year. And that is, that's not because we have an incredible amount of faith in just one vaccine. It's because we've got multiple vaccines that are in, um, that are in either innovative areas of medicine and vaccine development that allow for faster testing, uh, that allow for um, more rapid uh, production, uh, that allow for safer delivery um, in the mix and in the pack of leaders. And then we also have the, you know, old faithfuls like uh, live attenuated virus uh, or non-replicating non viral vectors um, that are more traditional in nature and are also leading the pack in terms of uh, potential vaccine delivery. So we've got we've got lots of horses, so to speak, running yeah. the same race. We know right. that one of them is going to cross the finish line. All right, very good. Uh, we will come back. We'll talk some more. Another segment with Brandon Daniels, the president of Global Market at Exiger. That is uh, at the, their name online, E-X-I-G-E-R, exiger.com. We'll find out more about this prospect of when and who in terms of a COVID-19 vaccine. one 560 jimbo is our number. one 505 4626 We'll be back in just a moment.
Wash your hands, avoid sick people, and touching your face. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. Brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Welcome back to the Jimbo Hannon Show at one 866 jimbo one 866 We're talking with Brandon Daniels, the president of global markets for Exiger.com, E-X-I-G-E-R.com, and about the availability of a COVID-19 vaccine. Let's talk to David in San Francisco. Good evening, David. Oh, thanks, uh, uh, Jim and uh, Brandon. You know, I wanted to ask a couple of things about the ownership of the vaccine. Uh, if the uh, if we want to really get the right one, they, don't they all have to share their data and then you know various labs try to find the right thing? But if you like try to te- keep the data on how the COVID really exists, you're basically sentencing millions to death by keeping a secret. So I'm wondering if the ownership of the vaccine would be public domain. You know, so it'll be seven cents a dose instead of ten thousand dollars a dose, and uh, and so whether or not the public domain sets it up so that the uh, the creation of it and the development of it is paid for by the taxpayers, but they get it uh, dirt cheap when it Interesting. finally Interesting. Yeah, are, are the intellectual property laws uh, waived in a case like this, Brandon? Not not traditionally. Um, the ability for a sophisticated lab to map the DNA of the virus already exists globally. But the great part of what um, has been done in the context of the uh, race to the vaccine here and in the context of Operation Warp Speed is that we have focused on um, essentially uh, vaccine types that allow us to modify very quickly the uh, way in which we block the vaccine. So as you've seen in influenza and some of the other traditional vaccines, from year to year, you'll see different levels of efficacy. That's because those are born out of an antiquated vaccine development process where you have to go through mammalian cells or or egg yolks, essentially, right? Um, The vaccine development process that we're taking on today and that was sponsored early on by the federal government in um, the Moderna um, uh, push and now the Pfizer push is that we can actually make tweaks as we see this vaccine mold and change. So even if you're essentially unlocking the DNA and the keys or the, the replicating processes like the RNA instructions of how the vaccine works and how it spreads, we're actually coming up with great and effective combat methods against virus iterations here. And so I'm, I, I'm not, I, I think uh, ownership and intellectual property here is not as much of a concern The one concern I do have is the ability for adversarial um, uh, countries or state actors being first to the table with the vaccine and creating supply chain bottlenecks for us. That's what I do really get. All right. What about the cost aspect that was brought up? Uh, Are we going to see people gouged or are we going to see uh, a a reasonable fee with uh, with many people? Uh, covered because of uh, uh, poverty or insurance plans? So um, I hate to go back to this platform point, Jim, but it's it's a key piece of understanding this puzzle. Yeah. Um, the RNA vaccines that I was talking about before, the Pfizer uh, one that's coming out and the uh, Moderna, they're both used um, or they're both created using far less expensive materials than conventional vaccine production. And so inherently they will be cheaper, but um, exactly how uh, the doses are distributed and exactly how they're priced, um, I think is still yet to be undetermined. The one thing I will tell you is that the economic um, impact of COVID in and of itself 
drives a strong desire to make this publicly available and to make this widespread. So I think we'll we'll see price be mitigated. I would certainly think so. I'll put it this way. There will be tremendous political pressure. Uh, absolutely, I cannot believe it even remotely conceivable that there would be anything that approaches a significant uh, charge uh, in uh, in such a case. All right. Uh, yeah, could could you imagine? Uh, well, I'm, I'm working on it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> here's uh, Michael in Virginia Beach now, Virginia Beach, Virginia, to be precise. Good evening, Michael. Uh, good evening, Jim, uh, and welcome back. Uh, Thank you. Mr. Daniels, I, uh, I'm i sorry. I, I, I'm sure you're not going to answer my question because you ducked Jim's question and you ducked the last caller's question. Uh, you sound like some kind of a, a, a front man for uh, this uh, pharmaceutical uh, cartel. It's, it really is a criminal cartel. Well, uh, fine. Don't... Uh, we don't really have time for the speech tonight, honestly, Michael. So do you have a question or not? Uh, character assassination night actually was last week. Okay, well, let, let me ask your guests what his qualifications are to even define uh, the difference between a vaccine and an injectable experiment. Ejectable, injectable Experiment. Well, I'm not even sure that's a technical distinction, but uh, I suppose we can put it down along these lines. Are uh, we reasonably certain that, and unfortunately, a lot of the public has a great deal of skepticism uh, about this, uh, something like two, two-thirds of the public uh, are fearful that there will be enough rushing here to uh, get production ready, that uh, not all safety guidelines will be followed. So how much faith should we put in the development of this vaccine? Yeah, so to to address uh, that question and and to speak candidly, I am I spend every day focused on the security of the supply chain of this virus into this market. The physicians that I work with are uh, civil servants; they're they're service members, and they spend undying hours ensuring that uh, when we're looking at the supply chains, when we're looking at the materials that are being used by these pharmaceutical companies, that we're not running any undue risks, any unnecessary risks, that this is a public good. Our job is, we're, I'm not employed by the pharmaceutical companies in this area. I'm working with the federal government to ensure the safety of the citizen right? And so I no matter what we, is developed, uh, I mean, uh, does uh, Exeger have a, a dog in this fight? I mean, does does your company don't. benefit? No, we don't. No, all right. We don't. We don't. Right. We don't benefit from from who, what, or how, uh, besides being you know recipients okay. of the uh, of the uh, of the vaccine. But but to answer uh, your question, Jim, do I feel confident that we're going to reach something that's effective? Phase one and phase two of the clinical trials are safety focused. The expansion of the clinical trial in the context of Pfizer that you mentioned today um, to 44,000 mm -hmm. participants, right, yeah. is because of the, the incontrovertible safety data. All right. And so that's, that's where people are following uh, and focusing on the science. I don't think that this is a rushed experiment. I think that it's in the interest of okay. everyone to very get good. to the vaccine as soon as possible. All right, very good. Uh, Brandon Daniels is president of Global Markets at Exiger.com, E-X-I-G-E-R.com. Back in a moment. 